we all live in this world. We're in the one click world and we're all guilty of it. We only want to take one step, one step to do the thing. We did the thing. We wrote down the idea. It's great. Why? It's the why part that like is hard. But if you can just train yourself to get to that point, I promise when you're going to craft the thing you want to craft, it'll help you out in the long run. I promise you. Powered by the Oak Rio. He's a prolific writer, director, world builder, USC film school graduate, and the founder of Rebel Kids Entertainment. If you're a fan of baseball, you've probably seen one of his numerous San Diego Padres hype videos. They are the best ones online. Beyond his many well-honed crafts, he's a connoisseur of good games, builds and runs captivating TTRPG campaigns, and shares his kind and creative soul with the world regularly. He's also a very dear friend. Justice, I'm stoked to have you on the podcast with me. Thank you, my boy. That was very, very kind of you. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to take this podcast first 10, 15 seconds of it, and just like play that daily, just to like good positive affirmations. Like people on YouTube make a whole career out of just like positive affirmations, and you just gifted me that for free. I didn't ask for anything. So I thank you very much. I've got you. These these introductions write themselves. Very. I don't have to sit and think for more than a second, and it just boom, and I could write it double the length. So, got one question I want to start us off with uh, because good. we we go back quite a ways. Um, so I want to bring everybody listening up to speed a little bit. So looking at your creative journey that led you to becoming a writer, a director, a filmmaker, and more. What do you see as some of the standouts in your story as a creative person? Wow, no, that's a great question. I like I'm completely stumped because there there are so many different aspects to all the thing all all the stories that I try and tell and all the stories that I gravitate to in general. I really think a lot of it is is curiosities. Like if it's if it's a if it's a storytelling technique that I want to try um I always go back to the the first the first one that always captivated me is when I first found out how to combine just filming on just a, an old camera that I had. And I had my sister Peyton be my subject. And I forget what movie I saw. I don't even know if I saw a movie or a TV show that depicted this, but I just found out just through editing and filming that it would be possible if I could disappear my sister and then reappear her in another place and it'd be magic so when i first found that out i was like peyton i, just, I had her sit there and at first i just, i even remember this as a kid she was like oh, i'm bored i'm bored i'm bored and then i was like no you'll see you'll see you'll see um wait no that's not true that's not true i tried because on the camera that i had it had an instant playback Thing, so I didn't have to go into an editing software. It was just purely through camera. So I edited through <laughs> I edited through knowing what the playback like feed was for the camera that we had. So I'd film Peyton. She'd be sitting up on like a tree branch. And I'd have her say, like, if you don't believe that I can't snap my fingers and reappear over there, then you'd be wrong. And then she'd snap her fingers and she snap her fingers and I'd immediate cut and I'd be like, get out of there, get out of there, try and get the same angle. And of course I didn't have a tripod, but it would look janky. So she would get out of the tree and then she would leave and film it. And then I'd have her go back and be like, see, I'm over here now. And ever since then, I've just, I've found mostly I've gravitated more of a, more out of like that function to, of storytelling to characters and relationships and it could be any relationship. It could be any kind of dichotomy between one to two to three characters and combining that love for movie making in general with, Oh, how can I combine that love for storytelling through whatever medium it is, whether it's writing or shooting and combine that with character has overall been just like the overall thorough line of any story I, I try to tell something that is creative, uh, different from something that I've never seen before that I'd like to see. Sometimes I swing and miss and it's, and it's, it doesn't hit, but at least it's something like, Oh, maybe that's why people haven't done that before because uh, I tried and that, well, that didn't hit. 
Uh, but I think that's that's it's a jumbled ish answer, but it, it it stems from my love of figuring out how to do certain things in movie making from the jump. That was before any storytelling. It was with a camera was the first thing. And then that transitioned into editing and then that transitioned into writing. And now here we are. And now here we are. Yeah. Wow. Okay. There's, I have several questions to go off of from there. So I want to start kind of with your journey to becoming a filmmaker and all these other things. Mm -hmm. What was it about that project you did with your sister? That do you remember that? I mean, it sounds like there were some feelings there of just like, oh, it was it. Oh, this is really cool. Was it? Oh, I'm telling. I'm telling a story. Or was it? Did it build more slowly over time? Do you remember? Yeah. It at first it was it was the curiosity. It was just up. Oh, oh, this is this is really cool. Like this is awesome. Uh, I I was always a very shy kid growing up. Uh, and just overall, I, I feel like I movie making just in general, just like fast forwarding has helped me like convey myself more outwardly. And it's allowed me to be more comfortable with who I am. But at that time, when I was a kid, um, I, you know, kids don't know how to express feelings or emotions or whatever. So if I was, if me and my sister were like against the world, we'd be like, we'd get out of here and we run away and we disappear and she'd snap her fingers and then she'd end up somewhere else. And we, we'd tell these different stories with that. Whether we wanted to make people laugh, we want to make each other laugh. We found that we could do that through just making these little stupid videos. It was just a form of expressing ourselves that we weren't comfortable with, whether it was talking with, whoever was around us or whoever it was through expressing herself through uh, our little videos that we made. How do you think filmmaking has affected the way you see the world? It's affected it in a great way, positively. Uh, the amount of different point of views that I've seen through different filmmakers, just, just going to watch movies is, has greatly expanded my view of how different people and artists view the world, how they express themselves and how I can learn from those creative people, how to express or tell my story. Mm -hmm. um, so it's impacted me greatly. It's, um, it's funny looking back to those early years as a kid and thinking, Oh, this was a cool thing that I could do. And I wanted to show that I could do a cool thing to how that curiosity led me to be more curious in how other people express emotions, tell stories. And I think that's one of the biggest blessings, I, I guess, that filmmaking and storytelling has brought me is that through hearing other people's voices, I formed... Uh, a better picture of the world and it's given me a way greater appreciation of life and you know my other artists that surround me so. i love that I, I love how you're describing curiosity as one of those kind of core drivers that really was that initial seed right mm -hmm. and i i feel the same way about you know my own creative journey and how i just try things, right and mm -hmm. it sounds like with storytelling with characters and narratives and different perspectives and trying out maybe different story formats for you, it sounds like that's a big part of it is you're like, I'm just curious to figure out how to do this or if this works or if I can come at it from this angle that's maybe different from some of the other angles that are maybe more common in certain narrative structures in film or in writing. Mm -hmm. and I, Yeah, I, I feel like that curiosity can be kind of an evergreen source of creative fuel, mm -hmm. right? Like it. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And I'm, I mean, I'm curious and I know you're interviewing me, but like, I, I want to know, cause I, I, we've talked about this forever. And even if I might know it now, like I'm curious of what your first like moment was in that moment of like curiosity, whether it was experimenting with, uh, with a sound, a, an instrument or, or whatever it was, I'm super curious to hear what yours was. That's a fantastic question. There's one moment that comes to mind that I think I can attribute my 
love for music too, which is mm-hmm. weird. I don't have singular moments for a lot of things in my life sure. but with music, specifically my love for the initial styles of music that got me into mm-hmm. wanting to make music. There's one instance. I think I was about 11 or 12. And growing up, I'd had music all around me. Like, you know, both of my parents um, had some facet of their personality that was slightly musical, not as music makers per se, but just they had good musical taste. So I, I heard a lot of stuff growing up, but it was always my parents' tastes. And, you know, it was scattered and my memories of it were never really strong. When I was 11 or 12, I got like a, a stereo, like an old boom. You know, you remember the old boom boxes or like yeah. the separatable pieces, like the old Walmart boom boxes? Oh, yeah. I got like a boom box that played CDs. And I got this CD. I, I'm, I forget which one came first, but there were two CDs that I got. One was a Reliant K record and one was a Switchfoot record. And... I got these CDs and put them into the boombox and I was just like the the way that the guitars sounded. And this was when I had kind of recently started playing guitar. I was like, this is so fucking cool. Like it sounds so different than all this other stuff that I've heard. And I, I remember thinking at 11, I was like, well, maybe in a different life I can make music. Like this, not not your typical eleven year old thought, but I was I I'd resign myself at eleven to like, you know, well I I swim that's what I do that's going to be my life. Sure. Maybe maybe in a different life I can make music, and then that passion kind of grew in the background for me over the years until it became unignorable kind of in my late teens. But yeah, that the the singular moment that I can attribute to was that sound of you know kind of now it's it doesn't sound like hard rock or or you know even regular rock it's kind of soft rock almost but at the time it was so radically different from what i was used to hearing and my ears were just like this is so cool like it was which album just which album was it the reliant k album i think it was the that was i forget the name of the album but i think it was uh the one with sunny with a high of 75 on it the Switchfoot album was the Meant to Live, Dare You to Move album uh, with the guitar in the, in the skate bowl. Like I, I can, both of those album images are emblazoned in my mind forever. Bree and I, Bree and my girlfriend, we were, we were driving up the freeway uh, back up to Los Angeles and we put in just like, we were just listening to some Reliant K songs. And it's so funny hearing you say that because I, I hear that now and I hear like, I'm picturing like a young Jamie <laughs> listening to this Reliant K album, like his mind being blown at like, mm-hmm. yeah, that's so funny to hear. Yours was Reliant K, and and Nick. mine was uh, pirated versions of Eminem and Fifty Cent from my from my Dato Boris in Macedonia, from the flea markets in Macedonia, and beautiful. That's a whole other story in and of itself. I, that's I love that so much. I actually, <laughs> I, I would love to go in that direction a little bit because, right. I mean, aside from your skill as a filmmaker and a director and a writer, you have, I would say, incredible taste in music. Like you have, you always have a good recommendation for music. How do you think your taste in music informs your filmmaking and your writing? it's it's huge i i always it's it's super funny that you say that because i think they're 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 so connected like and mainly my inspiration my inspirations i couldn't tell you when people when if someone were to ask me who are my favorite directors who are your favorite writers and i have a i have a ton of them i have so many of them i have a lot of favorite movies i clearly i have a ton but the answer that's always like in my brain is when I first heard Lupe Fiasco's Kick Push, it was like the greatest story I've ever heard. And it was it was so freeing and it was so beautifully written and entertaining. And I he, Lupe, like he put me there, like on a skateboard next to him. And I was right there. 
And I I will always go back to that moment where I was like, Lupe Fiasco is my favorite director and writer because that's what did it. And I, I got to tell you, when I look at uh, music and how that influences me as a storyteller, I mean, it's everywhere, whether it's, um, whether it's screenplays, whether it's editing videos, hype videos, um, or just writing or just trying to use, just like hear the rhythm of how, you know, there are a couple times where I was trying to write like a smooth, but like up-tempo scene that I really wanted. And I was like, how can I get this to match what I want? And then I, I threw on Malibu by Anderson Pack, and I was like, oh, it's perfect. <laughs> like, and I got it. And I, yeah, I, I think that to me, they're music and writing and filmmaking to me are just, they're the same um, in terms of how it, how the synapses in my brain fire off creatively, mm-hmm. not Excel as mediums, but just, just in terms of how I, mm-hmm. how I view them as um, storytelling devices and how they intrinsically are like kind of the same method. And they inspired me both ways. One Lupe Fiasco. I think that's, I think that's probably one of the first artists that you and I really bonded over musically. I rem- I, I can remember many conversations talking about, um, food and liquor and food and liquor too and just how he writes and how he paints pictures there's two questions I want to ask to, to go on those threads the first one is when you listen to music specifically music that maybe is very lyrical do you paint a picture in your head I mean how do you listen to those songs when I first listen to songs that are like lyrical like let's let's say let's let's go to the latest Kendrick album. Okay. I just knowing and just being a fan of his for a long time and knowing that he's had five years off from his previous album and knowing the weight or knowing what has happened in those five years, at first I imagine that artist recording the song. Like I'm there during the session. In the studio. In the studio, actually, like hearing them come with that energy or whatever it is, and I'm envisioning them telling this story for like the first time or whatever through different cuts, different takes. Uh, but yeah, that's that's the first time, and then through maybe a couple more listens, then I put myself in wherever I know where that artist's from. What, if they paint a picture scenically or if they're at a certain place, then I try and envision it as like, oh, what would the music video look like? Like, I'm curious if this would be like an abstract music video. Like, for instance, uh, N95 was like very abstract and it's beautiful. Um, uh, and I, the couple time, couple takes and listens after that, it's, uh, I view them as how would this look in the music video? Whether like an N95 off the album. The music video was very, very abstract and it was gorgeous and beautiful, but it it did exactly what the song was telling. Like, it, I totally saw it and I, I felt it. I felt the energy. I felt his words. It was beautiful. But then a song like We Cry Together with Taylor Page, the music video for that, it's the most visually like realistic thing. It's it's just the song. It's just two couples like fighting in a, in a house and it's it's perfect. Like that's the mood that he was intending. And it's, um, he is fascinating when it comes to how he tells his story through his visual mediums from songs. Mm -hmm. And that Kendrick's ability to collaborate with his partners, whether it's day free or whoever else does his music videos to communicate his, message through his song through a visual medium and that's kind of where i or i'm talking about how music and storytelling and movie making are like kind of the same thing if you can get that message across it's it's beautiful if it just if you if it hits your collaborators are on point they get the message it's it's gorgeous so it's it's almost sounds like what you're saying is there's kind of this undertone well one it sounds like part of your thinking about music is you almost think of the whole visual process, right? Them in the studio recording, 
And then you also place them in the context of where they were likely to draw their inspiration from, maybe. Mm-hmm. And then also the actual music video, which maybe is the most the thing that most people would think you think of when you're listening to music as somebody who creates in visual media. But yes. then beyond that, it it sounds like you're also describing, and tell me if this is true or if, if it's off base, it sounds like you're describing there's this emotive ability that is paralleled between the the pacing and the rhythm that happens in music. And then it's very similar maybe to the pacing and the rhythm that happens in a good script or a good scene where there's a, a cadence to it in the same way. But do, do, you, do you agree with that? Oh yeah, no, a hundred percent. It's if you listen to just any, just any well written, you can feel it through just any verse, chorus, like hook. Like it kind of follows the same like narrative structure in a weird way. Now that I'm thinking of it, it's just it's expedited. It, it's expedited because the song's so short. But if you really like stretch it out, scripts kind of the same way in terms of like how uh, like BPM would be like uh, how many like. Um, like it could be anything. It depends on what script you're writing. It could be how many fight scenes you want, or how many uh, dialogue scenes, uh, what whatever it may be. Uh, that's interesting to think about it that way. Or just like a song is just like a very very tight tight script. And if you draw that out, it's kind of the same thing. Think about it. I think it's an interesting parallel that maybe shows the way that you think about you know writing scripts mm. listening to music and and how closely paired they are because i i've had conversations with other filmmakers and whatnot and i feel like that's not a perspective that comes up as often is that sense of rhythm that sense of cadence i mean here's here's another question what do you think of when what comes to mind when i say a phrase something like the rhythm of a good script it depends on the kind of script because you can hit all the beats and it just be kind of formulaic and it still be really well paced, really well written. Um, but if it's something kind of abstract, it's not clunky. As long as it, no matter if the script is formulaic, but in it like a really good way, if it hits all the beats and it does what you want it to, they're twists, they're good character beats, and it's a really, really good script. And that's what the artist is trying to go for great like that's a really well paced well written script but even if it is an abstract super freaking weird script but as long as that script is authentically that writer and writes in a way that is very unique and you are you allow yourself to be open to that writer's perspective voice on the page and you don't look at it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what an example would be like if there's a, a whole page and it's just written like one line at a time, like one word at a time. And you're like, this is kind of weird, but like, I'm up for it. This is kind of cool. So I think it is individuality and uniqueness is kind of key when it comes to pacing. Because I don't think there is just one one pace. And if an artist can or whoever's consuming that art is willing to allow themselves to be taken for a ride and whether it's you know slow burn or if it does exactly what you expect it to do both things can be paced really well it's just a a matter of like what kind of story are you trying to tell what emotion are you trying to provoke from the audience or anything like that it's it's a tough abstract to kind of think of but just listening to you describe how you think of music and how you think of writing and and pacing a scene it's it's so fascinating to hear you describe it because we're talking we're, we're talking basically from two sides of the same coin right in that you're predominantly a visual creator i am predominantly an auditory creator so i think there's a there's a question that's kind of begging to be asked here which i'm very curious to hear your answers on because i think there's already some stuff that we've touched on a little bit but i want to make sure we get it what do you think some commonalities are, maybe some commonalities that don't get discussed as frequently between filmmaking and music making? If you don't have emotion in your song or your movie or your TV or your book or whatever it is, it's interesting because then you get into a point of like, what does what does art do? And is art 
purely emotion based or is it not is it meant to just be left and you can just examine it and you just draw your own opinions on it you know regardless of emotion so my biggest answer to your question is i think it contains emotion it would have to contain heart and it provoke an emotion from an audience whether it's the most you know club bouncy my house by flow rider or free bird or whatever like it's it's still evoking something it, it it's a story about something and it makes its audience whether or not they're trying to be active and listening for that emotion or not if it's just passively it's still making you feel something mm. and i think that's i think that's the biggest that's the biggest commonality between music auditory listening or auditory just storytelling and visual storytelling do you have one because i think that's to me is like yeah, I guess my my mind kind of goes to to a lot of terms that seem to have overlap, which is, you know, the thing you were describing about the single line, right? Mm. That's lyrics. That's a lyrical yeah. pacing, right? Mm. Um, cadence, tempo. These are both terms that I think filmmaking and music can use. And maybe music uses it a little bit more heavily, but filmmaking certainly t- draws from that same pool of terminology. I think... Converse to that, music makers sometimes talk about painting a picture or setting the scene, right? Especially an artist, a lyrical artist like Kendrick or like Lupe, who is really trying to take you on a journey through a set of scenes in a song, a very tightly compacted journey. And then also, something you said earlier, which I'll say again because it was a really good point, the narrative structure of a song, the narrative pacing, the arc of a song's story. That's something that maybe doesn't get talked about as much because the typical formats of verse, verse, chorus, verse, bridge, chorus, whatever, it's not seen in the same way, but it's the same type of breakdown as something like a hero's journey or a three-act structure or what have you. So I think there's a lot of... This is something that I, I just am really interested in. And one of the things I love about these conversations is ways that you can take terminology and ideas and concepts from one media or set of media and kind of inject them or move them over to another set and and reinterpret them and it sounds like with music that's what that's you're already doing that with music in yeah. filmmaking you think about setting the vibe and setting the right tempo with an upbeat uh, scene with an Anderson Pock song when you're writing i think so that's that's super cool to hear so that's why i asked is there's these intersections that come up that a lot of artists just intuitively do. And it's one of those things that can kind of reinvigorate you and make you maybe more curious about the things you can explore. And totally. Yeah. Yeah. Not to tie it all together, but it's no, very, of course. like it totally makes sense. It's very cool to hear you describe it. Um, Cause I think it's, it's an untapped or less tapped source of artistic inspiration and creative inspiration that, really opens up the world to whoever's making. It's like, oh, what What if I, as a music maker, went and watched a bunch of really cool dancing? And this is something that people do. It's like mm-hmm. you go and it's the reverse choreography. Have you ever seen this? Yeah. 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 So it's Thanks. just for just for everybody who's listening. Um, what they... So regular choreography is you have a song and you create a routine to the song, a dance routine to the song. Reverse choreography is you create a dance routine and then you remove any music that was used in the making of it and you have a music maker make music to the the dance routine, which is so fucking cool. (laughs) Yeah. When you were talking about cadences and terms and how certain certain terminology is the same in terms of how a song's written, a moment in the song, a moment in a movie, um, for instance, like if someone's trying to create like a great like climactic moment in a movie, whether it's you know Tony Stark snapping his fingers in Infinite in uh, Infinity War Part Two, Endgame, no in Endgame, and he does it, and it's like oh yeah, he did it. How how can how can someone write something like that in a climactic moment that is the same climactic moment as to when Alicia Keys? It's like the craziest note at the end of a bridge. And then it goes into like the end, like core, like it's the same 
feeling. It's the same climax, resolution. Right. Like, she's a girl and she's on fire. Keep that in. <laughs> Absolutely. You hit it perfectly. Uh, and then it goes back down. And it, it is kind of the same it, like in terms of how do you create the feeling that someone gets when someone hits like that really high note in a song and make that into, you know, whether it, people get that experience from if they're at a concert or going to a movie, like when they get that feeling of, oh my God, they did it, they hit the note, you know. The weekend has made it a killing off of doing exactly that. You know, he he knows knows when to go in. Dude's very talented. There's there's something, there's a topic in here that I would love to focus in on a little bit because I think it's really poignant that you are mentioning the things about narrative structure. So what I mean, it seems like a lot of what you're talking about with music, with filmmaking, is the ability to create that that arc, right? That storytelling arc. Right, your high points, your low points, your climax, your resolution, your denouement, um, all of that. How do you approach putting together a narrative structure beyond just the traditional? Oh, I like to start with this or that. Like, how? What is your process bringing that together? How do you build that? Uh, Now it is much more refined and much more outline driven and structured because if I swim out to sea and I don't have a chart to go. And I'm just excited to go swim, to go maybe watch some dolphins out there. Then maybe the dolphins swim away, and you don't know. <laughs> then you get caught in a riptide, and you're like, "Oh, I didn't have a plan to get back. That's not great." So as much as much as I would like to just have this feeling of like, "Oh, I need to write this idea down," and I do. If I just get ideas, I could I write them down and I just I throw them on a wall. I for my last feature script that I wrote, I had little notes that like that I had I had a note note card wall and if there are any beats that I wanted in a movie I just write it down I throw it up on a wall and it would be the worst like crime string theory board you've ever seen in your life but that's for another day <laughs> that's for another day when when it's time to organize those thoughts then you're like oh okay I really like that beat that could go there and then what's just the connective tissue that I could bring all of that heart home but yeah at first, I thought I could just write and just write, but I found out that in my brain, like I need after that murder board string theory madness, like I need to outline my at least my scripts because without that, it's just like pure excitement and like adrenaline going into the, into the script, and you just don't know how each character relates to one another, what story you're getting here. You're just you're excited about an idea. And I I completely encourage that. If you if you really have that idea and you want to write, go write. Go do it. But I found for me that if I want to make it presentable and readable to whether it be my friends, family, executives, whoever, like I, I need to have it outlined. But yeah, I've I've definitely found that about myself. I need some structure or else my creativity is just gonna bounce off a wall and it's I need to rein it in. I need a focus sphere and that's the murder board wall with all the beats ideas yeah. and an outline. But that's just for script writing. Editing, it's a little more freeform. Editing okay. is more, it depends on the project. Mm. If it's, uh, if it's an actual, if it's an actual movie or a short film, it's the, the outline and structure is still there. I would get the, I would get the script. I would watch all of the, all of the takes and it's pretty much kind of built in there. It's about how much of a tempo that you want to bring to the film as a as an editor, but also like it's a collaborative art. You have to make sure the director is getting the the tempo that she or he wants. Like it just needs to you need to collaborate in that sense. So um, editor, it's a little bit more strict. Just for the the Padres hype videos that I do. Um, it's very much like what song is cool, who would, would that song fit with what player and how does, how do the fans and how, how do the fans of the team, how the fans of the specific player, whether they're Padres or not, or if they just like the player, how, what is their perception of, let's just say Manny, uh, Manny Machado and how does the song reflect him 
and how does the pacing and cuts of that video reflect who he is as an athlete and who he is as a person even because i feel like those are the videos that people really connect to that watch that any padres fans that watch my videos it's more so they felt like the video embodied that person instead of the player it's it's the person okay. and uh, that's pretty much the only thing that guides me in those kind of sports videos it's the same thing for the san diego soccers that i do <laughs> for any D D campaign that i do it has to be it has to be like here's a world that lays in the world here's a world now go play Play. So it isn't really structure. It's just a matter of the rules of the world. It it all varies from each different kind of story that I've put out there. It's tough, but it's also easy at a point. For instance, like last week, last week and the last two weeks, I've been working on a script. And at a point, I felt it was at a good stopping place. And I use so much of my brain on that script. And it's a very different part of my brain as the go edit uh, a sports video, go edit a trailer, go edit something else, part of my brain. You've just given me so many good examples that I, I really want to take time to move through. I, I heard three distinct answers in that. So I want to make sure each one, because I think each one we can explore and, and there's some deeper aspects of creativity in each one that I, I really want to touch on. With your writing process, mm. it sounds like the, the post-it sticky note you know, string theory board is really you allowing yourself to just get all of your ideas out and not judge them until it's time to start trying to put them together. Is that pretty accurate? Oh, it, it, it's a hundred percent true. There are, when you have an, an idea that you want to tell, whether it's a movie, song, anything, you gotta, you gotta get it out there. You gotta write it down. It can't, you can't sit that it can't sit in there. You have to add so many People that I know, what whatever process it is, some people have journals on their bedside table or wherever. And we're so, you know, we live in this world, we have our phones on us all the time. And if you just have yeah. an idea, you just you just write it down. But I, I do feel, at least for me, uh, other people are definitely probably different. Uh, it has to get on like paper or something. It's got to get on. Like if I write it down, it becomes like a thing. It becomes okay. out there in the world a little bit. And even if it is, even if you need to get it out on like uh, on a device of any kind, I would, for me, I would still print out the outline that I type or anything and I would still write on it and make little notes and make it like a, a physical, tangible thing for me. Yeah. And that to me is so important to not let any idea no matter how stupid you think it is how dumb it is how if you don't know how it relates to the story overall you will be surprised two weeks from you having that thought or you're like oh damn it i could have i definitely could have used that there but what exactly was i thinking when i had that idea that i really liked about it because that that's the, that's the big key the overall beat itself is just very general and it could be whatever. And that could be the thing that you're pushing back on, mm. but there's something in your brain that made you go. I really love this. I love this idea. Why do I love this so much? Whether it's just a very small emotional beat or it's a cool visual gag, whatever it is, it meant something to you. And the quicker that you can get that out and out in the world, whether typing it, writing it down, putting on your, your murder string board. It's out there. It exists. And I think that's also kind of helpful. I do this. I'm very guilty of not doing this as well, but I've found that most of the beats that I write down and I kind of write kind of like, uh, like a parents that when they take like photos and then they write on the back of the photo, like this was at the zoo when justice Ate a bunch of cotton candy. Ah, for that you are, for that you are note. about to answer a question that I was just about to ask you. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, it, you you write down what made you feel that way in that moment, and the quicker that you can do that, I think the better and more realized, and the more you'll you'll 
wind up producing something that you'll love even more because it's so a part of you, even in these moments when you're thinking and they do, they, 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 they spring up at the, at the worst times, you, whatever it sometimes they're good. Like just shower thoughts. That's fine. But like the most inconvenient times and you don't want to write something down, your phone's dead, whatever promise you if you've had that thought and if you're watching this you probably are because you're an artist like me and jameson just write it down get it out there that is that is my biggest advice that i've stumbled across answering this question write down all of your good bad stupid ideas because you love them no matter how stupid they are no matter how good no matter how bad write them down that is a piece of sage wisdom i feel like and I think your addition of not just write your ideas down when you have them, no matter how bad you think they are, but on the back of the postcard, so to speak, write down the feeling or the context or the environmental thing that was going on that made you feel like it was a an idea you wanted to write down. Yeah. I think that is I want to go try that now because I don't do that yet. I write down some ideas, but I don't contextualize them. I only do that I only do that randomly. And when I do that, it's like I should do this more. No, I should really do this part, but it's it's easy to just write it down. And if you do that, that's fine. That's a step. But if you could just take the extra step, we're all we we all live in this world. We're in the one click world, and we're all guilty of it. We all want to take one step, one step to do the thing. We did the thing. We wrote down the idea. It's great. Why? It's the why part that like is hard. But if you can just train yourself to get to that point, I promise when you're going to craft the thing you want to craft, it'll help you out in the long run. I promise you. So with keeping those ideas and writing those ideas down, with writing those ideas down and having this cachet of emotional hooks, ideas, good, bad, whatever, how do you know when it's time to sit down or stand up and start connecting the threads on the wall and connecting the ideas? when you can't see any white space or whatever color your walls are behind the notes, you're like, maybe I should organize these. And if it turns out that's like an actual, the thing is, once you have those beats, I can't think of a clever uh, metaphor at the moment, but if you, if you organize your, your beats into, into typical, whatever story structure you want to tell, I, I understand that there's a, there's, Typical structure and act structure and whatever in TV movies. I know that exists. If you have your own thing, and I know people do, do your own thing. But if it's your thing and you find that your thing is is filled, and you notice that like, oh, this is actually pretty full. Then maybe you look at your beats on the wall and you're like, oh, okay, is there a scene that I could fill in between this one of of Jamie petting a dog at the grocery store? And then Jamie back at his apartment going, huh, maybe I want a dog. Is there something in between there that I missed that is necessary to like inform the actions of, of Jamie wanting a dog. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you have, it kind of gets to a point where if your brain feels cluttered at any moment and all any artist's brain feels cluttered about 87% of the time during any time you want to do a project at all, whatever. If your brain feels cluttered and you have whatever my process with the, with the string theory board and you organize it and you're like, okay, let's move some stuff around, let's move some stuff around. And you are missing that scene. Then I, I wouldn't force yourself, like don't pressure yourself, but I think it is an interesting creative uh, exercise to when you are organizing those beats that you had from when you were just brain vomiting and writing your little postcard notes to yourself and why you made why you wrote down this bad or stupid or funny idea and you put it up there and then you realize putting that next to a scene that I wrote down on a note card two weeks ago actually fits really well there, but there's no connective tissue to move the plot along or inform a character enough. Then you take those two scenes and you kind of cage match, cage match those two scenes and see what one result of those two things like comes out in I typically, what that is, is I think in that moment, for me, that's when you know that like, okay, it's time to start thinking about how to structure this, how to organize your thoughts. And my biggest advice 
for anyone listening to for that specifically is if you see your wall and it has a bunch of cool beats, but you think it's just missing something, just watch, watch the kind of movie that you want your movie to look like or inspired by your TV show to look like. If you can find the script for it online, look for it. Look for that thing that that can plug into your idea. Mm-hmm. Because first of all, if, if you're if you're a filmmaker and love movies like myself, this is just me and the scenario, but this applies to anything, songs, books, anything. Yeah. There's a certain piece of art that you're inspired by go to that thing and consume it and i guarantee you there will be something from that piece that will inspire your your art if you realize that it's the exact same piece that's fine that's fine if you just write like oh jamie goes to the store to meet a dog and then jamie goes to the apartment to think about wanting a dog and then the middle scene that you come up with is Mom goes into Jamie's closet and then ETs in the closet with his face there. You're like, okay, well, maybe, maybe we can workshop that a little bit. Maybe Jamie hit the dog in the closet. Like, it's not the exact scene that you want, but like, at least it's something. It's getting your ideas, getting your thoughts out there, watching the thing or reading or listening to the thing that you are inspired by. Mm-hmm. And then seeing if there's any connective tissues that you can gain from watching watching, listening, reading the thing. Once you have your cache of ideas, you uh-huh. know it's time to start sifting through them when the wall of ideas is full, when you're you're yeah. scrolling through a, a, a seemingly endless list. To keep with the fridge analogy, you know it's time to start sifting through when the fridge door won't close anymore. Yeah, it's bad. And then the questions so, you answered, exactly. So, so maybe some, some food's starting to go rotten, some ideas are becoming stale, so it's time to capitalize uh-huh. on what you have. And then... Uh-huh. The additional thing that you answered, sans even question, you just kind of naturally extended it, was in that, it sounds like what you're saying, you will have potentially some gaps between otherwise good ideas when you're starting to structure it. Maybe you have, I'm just going to keep with this cooking analogy because I think it's very fitting and it's generalizable. Maybe you have the eggs and you have the bread, but you don't have the cheese, right? And so you're like, okay, what can I use in place of this? I'm going to break from the analogy here for a second. What you're saying is going out and consuming something that inspires you will help you figure out how you want to bridge that gap and fill in those spaces between your otherwise already half-built ideas in a way that, to use a phrase that I really like that you've used, creates that connective tissue connects all the ideas together and creates a system or a unit that can then be the basis of an idea that forms as a complete or more complete thought. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's it. (laughs) There's so much in there that one, I would like to go and try and apply to my own creative practice because you, you're talking about beats and ideas for stories. I think I mean, George Ann, who was the last episode of the podcast, she talks about, um, you know, using voice notes. And I know she uses voice yeah. notes a lot to store her ideas. And it's that same idea of just kind of like slowly but surely adding to that repository of, of creative gems to be polished right. at a later date. And I I really love the way that you've described, like when there's a gap, here's how you can go and fill it is by seeking inspiration from creators who you admire and maybe want to either emulate or, you know, create in similar veins. And I liked what you said about it doesn't have to be in the medium that you're making in. It's whatever. It's whatever makes you feel that feeling maybe that you're trying to fill in that space. I think that's genius. Totally. It's just, it's, I mean, that's just how we, at least it's just how, how I, like how I relate to what I want to get out of a story that I want to tell that I feel like can resonate with other people. If I can find the source of inspiration that resonated with me, then hopefully that will, that will spark something in me that hopefully I can put out and then eventually it can relate to other people who whatever I put out. 
So absolutely. So I want to. There's this answer you gave a little while ago, and I want to keep drilling into parts of it because I think it was such a good explanation of the different types of storytelling that you find yourself doing. So we've talked about idea generation. We've talked about how to sift through good ideas and connect them and create that connective tissue. What do you do after that? I mean, you mentioned structure. You mentioned you start to bring things together. You have maybe a rough blocked outline of, okay, here's the key changes. What do you do and how do you take it from there? I mean, I think from there, whether it's, if we're just talking about writing at the moment, like it's just, just go, just go, baby. Just, just write whatever, write whatever you want. Um, and that, I mean, that's the that's the key to all of this is to, and I know, I know this is, I know this is tough, but to not think about how how something may be perceived or you may not want it, or think it's not reading exactly how you want it to. If you just write it, I promise you, as an as an artist, will be so much better off if you just write something get something done have it finished whether it's if you want to finish a scene by the end of the day or it doesn't matter sentence action description scene setting doesn't matter you can put your own limits on something but just finish that one thing no matter if you like it or think you don't like it and then the practice of editing something in script is is so valuable and it you have to think about the overall goal that you want to put it, like come away with when telling this story. Does this, you know, scene setting evoke the emotion that we that we really really want? If if we just write, um, I, I want to like I want to merge the the Jamie wants a dog analogy with the with the kitchen cook analogy it, it depends on it it honestly dep- it depends on the the vibe of the story that you really want why is it so important for jamie to have a dog and why is all of the food going rotten in his kitchen what's going on what's going on so if you can feel like whatever is important in that moment in your in your script and again this is where i think watching stuff and watching the stuff that has inspired you before listening or reading has inspired you Mm -hmm. you have to it is it's a it's a really thoughtful practice in terms of you start off you write all the stuff get it out there word vomit do as much as you can but then when the editing kicks in it is a really Conscientious, pro- conscientious pro- process to really think about what is important and why you're telling the story, and that to me is maybe my favorite part of writing because you can kind of see and be excited with like how how you want it to be structured or what you want to tell plot wise, whatever. But at the end of, end of the day, hopefully with my scripts, I want to. Well, first of all, I want to write something that I would enjoy. And I know I know what I like as an audience member. And if I don't think I'm getting that, or if I, I know I can get there, but maybe it needs another scene here and there, then it's just back to the drawing board. And it is pers- it's 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 tedious and like you have to like the practice of patience when it comes to telling a story that you really want is 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 crucial, you know. Jamie, we've we've heard, we've listened to, we've watched so many things that you can just tell <laughs> were rushed through whatever. Like, and they were just mm. you're doing it just to do it, right? Yeah. And that's fine. And that's totally fine if that's what you're going. But if you really want to tell something meaningful and you want to like kind of bear your soul really with what you want to do, it is important to kind of try and find that thorough line of even if it's a joke, why what does that do for me? as an audience member, if I write a joke that I just want to be funny, but it doesn't inform how, let's just say the main story is Jamie wants a dog. How does that inform Jamie's character, even in that joke? How does it make us feel that Jamie, you know, go through a, a, a low point before that and we're, we're, we're excited that he found something funny 
And he's laughing. It's like, oh, okay, that's that's nice. Our character is kind of back on track after this low point of not having a dog. And now he's like joking with friends or had a funny experience with a dog. And it's like, oh, cool. So there's always a purpose. Every single line, every single scene has to have a purpose. But you have to make sure before you get into that practice of editing, you have to get your thoughts on paper very similar to the murder string board beat idea when it comes to <laughs> writing it on whatever screenwriting device it is, whether it's final draft or a typewriter or a napkin, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You just got to get it out and no matter what. And then what comes after that is the disciplined part that may, may suck and it may hurt. But if you allow yourself to have that patience and to really allow yourself to be vulnerable in terms of really wanting to know how you want the story to go and how you want the audience to feel, how you want yourself to feel looking back on making this going, I wish I didn't pull that punch of a scene. I wish I didn't do this because I was too hesitant. Make sure that those are exactly the things that you want to say, because in that particular project, like you only have one project. So make sure that, Make sure you tell the stuff that you want to tell. Mm -hmm. so, that's it. It's a it's a practice of freedom, and immediately after that, very strict discipline to hone that creative mumbo jumbo that you've spat out there, and how to mm -hmm. refine it and crystallize it. That it's difficult, but if you find ways to practice that and affect it, it's it's beautiful. And I've only, I've had glimpses of it. And when it does strike, like it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. I love what you're saying about the importance of discipline, diligence, patience with not only yourself, but with the process, right? Mm -hmm. And, and the importance of setting up systems that compound your project towards being done that increase the creative value of it to you over time right it's you have these raw assets these raw ideas that you then structure in a way and then you start to slowly but surely sculpt pieces of what you're building into the final form and you're starting to question that motif or that theme or that general arc that you're trying to create as this emergent property of the story no one scene makes the story something that sends its audience walking away going, man, I really need to reevaluate the close relationships in my life if that's the motif of the story. And it sounds like what you're saying is that's for you, a, what you really enjoy in the process is getting to craft that kind of meta narrative of, okay, it, what, what story does every scene tell? What story does every beat tell? But then what story does the arc as a whole leave you walking away with? Yeah. yeah. How, how, how it, that's a huge part of it, but it's also about how if you were to put yourself, I sometimes do this as if I were to have like the oh my own movie theater in my mind, how it would look, how it would look on on the screen. If I'm sitting there and I'm trying to be impressed, like I'm trying to imagine the 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 relevance of it and knowing the ride that you're about to take your audience on the book, song, movie. What, what have you. You need to kind of put yourself in the position of, of the audience because without that, then it's not the, it's not the self-indulgent that people immediately go to or like, Oh, that's self-indulgent art, whatever. But yeah. it, if by, if by chance you're just, you're just, you don't, you don't edit enough or you didn't think too much about how the audience is going to react and how it feels no matter if you're the nicest person in the world and you care about people or if you don't if you're not a self-indulgent person your project may come across as self-indulgent which you really don't want because you want people to enjoy it and you want people to get the process which is completely unfair completely unfair to like any writers i met really wonderful nice writers but if <laughs> their stuff stuff is unstructured then you're just like i don't know what this I don't know what the purpose is that you can just tell it's something that they wrote for themselves, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But if, if you want to take that next step and you want to present it out into the world, mm -hmm. then there needs to be some sort of palette to wet for your audience. 
And you can take that immediately and be like, oh, this is audience here. You recognize this. This is cool. And then once you have them, then you can contort them. Then you can then you can play around with them and not give them exactly what they want and mm. and make it more unique to your own. But there there has to be something where you have to have your audience in mind. Whether it is if you want to scare them, you want to make them nauseous for if you want if your movie is playing at Sundance and your <laughs> your goal is to make have the most walkouts at Sundance that you want, make that movie. Do it. But <laughs> it's it's very important to have that audience in mind once you're trying to get past the I want to be creative, I want to make this work for me, you have to start thinking about the like the public. Whether whether you like it or not, it's tough. It was tough for me just because it it's I'm still consider myself very introverted, but it's still something that that's how I express myself. That's how I express emo- emotions and my thoughts. Mm-hmm. And to try and that's the other thing when you think about it it's tough to be in that position at least for me to like assume or read what an audience wants and i think that's why it's so so important to know what audience you're going for and if it if whatever project you're making doesn't land with someone you have to you have to know like oh okay this wasn't a part of my target audience mm-hmm. unfortunately not everyone is going to like the thing that you do. And it's tough for some people. It's tough for me. I'm a big people pleaser. I want everyone to like my my stuff because I want them to have a good time. But yeah. I recognize that some people may not like, you know, movies about Jameson wanting, uh, wanting a dog and having a fridge that's stuffed all the way full with food <laughs> and rotting, rotting fruit. But some people might like that. And, you know, if that's the movie you want to tell, that's the story you want to write, song you want to tell, book you want to write about, then yeah, know your audience. It's very much a a balancing act that I think a lot of creatives in, inherently have, especially early on in, in careers and projects and maybe even at various points throughout. That balancing act of, okay, I'm doing this for me, but I also need to adapt the perspective of the people that are going to be enjoying this because I want them to connect with it. The visual that comes to mind of the, the not even a metaphor, quite literally, like the visual that comes to mind with you describing this is you're almost like a guide or like a leader. Like you really are getting with your art, with whatever you're producing, you know, nobody wants to be led or guided by somebody who just meanders. Unless that's, I mean, maybe that's the niche yeah. thing. There's a subset of people maybe that like, would enjoy that for its own reasons. But generally... If you're going to get guided by somebody, you want to have a sense that they know where they're going. But having that sense of, you know, the person who is guiding you through a story or a narrative or an emotional journey, which is really, you know, what I think a lot of great art does is it takes you on a ride, is early on, maybe it's really important to have a sense of like, okay, this person that we're following for the next 90 minutes, two hours, album, book, we got to know that they know where they're going. I can't meander because I, I can't trust somebody who's going to meander into and potentially through this time commitment of whatever. Beyond that, I, I can't connect with that, right? Right. So what you're describing, it sounds like, yeah, good guides are able to take... Good, good creative individuals are able to take people on a journey where they can lead a group of their audience through an emotional experience. Yes. Great ones are able to show the right things early and then bend and or tweak expectations once there's buy-in and there's a sense of trust of like, okay, we know that this person knows where they're going or we trust that this person knows where they're going with this. So we're along for the ride still, right? And it becomes this, all right, let's see where this goes. But it's, to your point, it's very hard to do that really early on. So it requires you to put yourself in the shoes of the audience to build up that empathy or that sympathy for their perspective Mm -hmm. coming into maybe a cold open of a movie that's meant to hook you and then going, okay, you've bought in for 10 minutes. Now it's time for us to give you a lot of information as to why this is important or stuff that's going to be entertaining or a source of good entertainment for the next hour, two hours. 20 hours in the case of a season of something. Mm -hmm. So I really like what you said about putting yourself in the shoes of your audience. Great artists are 
riverboat cruise guides with a 4.87 <laughs> Yelp review who know how to drive a hundred mile an hour river boat thing and you can ride it. You go fast. You're like, all right, this guy can drive. Okay, great. This guy, this girl could drive. And then they do some stupid shit of pulling a 360 and then like, I wasn't ready for that. But then you go around and at the end you're good. It's a, it's a nice little ride, but immediately during your, your, your analogy, I apologize. My brain went to great artists are riverboat captains who are greatly reviewed, who are crazy, but they let you know that they can drive a boat in the beginning. They drive yeah. a boat, then all of a sudden they'll do some crazy shit that'll 540 the boat and you think you're going to die, but you don't because they've established in the beginning that they can drive a boat pretty well. Exactly. And at the end of the thing, you're like, okay, I'm glad I'm glad we went on this ride and journey. And sometimes yeah. you want to go back again. Sometimes you're like, I, it wasn't for me. And that's like you said, that's that's knowing that some people are going to connect really well with what you make and some people aren't. And it's not going to be for everybody. Right. It's yeah, I, I think the if I were to distill it down to a sentence, I think what we're saying is it's good to understand that the person who made the thing that you're looking at or settling into early on, you need to know they're in control. Then yes. once you know they're that they're in control, it's okay if they maybe go a little off the rails because you know that they know how to get it back. I think the best example of that is the pilot for Breaking Bad because they were able to establish who Walter White is as a cancer-stricken, intelligent, crazy smart chemistry teacher who is then given the problem of having cancer and how he wants to provide for his family. And then he goes on a ride along, sees, slash meets his former student, Jesse Pinkman. And then they start a meth business together. And then you buy into like, oh, this is what we're doing. We were established to this character. We feel for this character. And he wants to do what he can for his family. So immediately right there with that audience, you establish, you, you're rooting for this character regardless. Mm -hmm. The show, the, the show at the time, I remember I was freaking out. The show's about meth. We were watching a show about meth. We're glorifying it. Everyone was freaking out. It's like, it's yeah. clear why we did. It doesn't matter what they are. There's so many like messed up premises for TV shows and movies. But what they do is in the beginning, first five, 10 minutes, they hook you with something that makes you identify with the character, the story or whatever. And then you're along for the ride. You're, yes. you're, you're hooked. You're done. Yeah. I love that example. And it's, it's cool to hear you break down uh, an instance of television that did that really well. Cause I, I agree. I think breaking bad is an incredible it's a masterclass in storytelling and, and emotional buy-in and subverting expectations in all the right instances. And yeah, fantastic example. There's one other thing I wanted to mention because I think it just encapsulates so well what you've described. And, and if you don't know about it yet, I think it would be interesting. I would be interested to know your thoughts on this. There is a structure called, I believe it's called Kaner's Diamond Model of Participation. Looking at one of the diagrams right now, you start, you expand out, you gather diverse perspectives, you come to early conclusions, right? You start to maybe plug ideas into each other. And then the middle, the chasm, is called the groan zone. Literally the groan called the groan zone. zone. The groan not, zone. Not the crone zone. Not the crone zone. <laughs> not, not Jake Cronenworth. Not beloved Jake the groan Cronenworth. groan zone with a G. The groan zone. Got it. And and this is this is the part of the process where people get really fatigued because there's this back and forth of I'm I'm coming up with these ideas I'm trying to figure out what works but I'm also trying to start moving towards an answer moving towards an output moving towards a solution and I think that this model overlays really nicely with what you've described with your process of creating literally a board of ideas and starting to string them together. And then, like you were saying, using that routine and that system and that discipline to go, okay, you you are trying to put some some soul or you're trying to bear your yourself in what you're making and and maintain that initial feelings that drive the thing you're creating. But you're also trying to relate to your audience. You're trying to start using the technically correct things or do things in a way that people trust that you know what you're doing so they buy into the emotional story. 
Mm-hmm. So I think it's a concept that overlays really nicely with what you've described. I don't think they're exactly the same, but I I would be really, one, interested to hear, do you have any thoughts on that? And two, I think it's just a really cool visualization of, of a lot of what you've just described. No, I, I think it's it's very interesting. I'm definitely going to to read up more on the grown zone. Uh, <laughs> that's the episode, that's the title episode of this podcast is Jameson and Justice Enter the Grown Zone. Uh, uh, no, the geriatric um, version of this the, podcast, the, maybe the, ger- the groans. Yeah. Um, no, like it's it's a complete thing. It's interesting. It's it's very. Um, I I don't. I can't. I'm stumbling on the word. It's kind of um, maybe it's a little vindicating that my my method that I that I try is like a it is like a legit practice that I if I I'd be curious to look at it more and see if there's. If there's anything that I'm missing out that could be very beneficial to me, like if it's if I'm missing like just part of the tutorial guy where I'm like my brain's already going here, it's very it's very good to try and diagnose. That's one thing I I'm quite bad at this, but diagnosing how um, how I am as a learner, how I am as a um, what's my best way of like practicing the thing that I do. Okay. And that's really interesting that you told me that because I mean those those all like you said they check all the boxes that I do and maybe that's just like an instinctual thing that some people have in their brain that's just how they operate. And so the, that's pretty cool if you can kind of diagnose like how how you think and how you operate creatively. I don't know if there are any tests or any you read up on that. I mean you just found that out right now which is great. Um, but yeah, I mean, draw me the link. I'd be super curious to see if there's anything in that, that I I'm doing that maybe I'm doing like subconsciously, or there's something that I just haven't been doing that could maybe help my practice even more. I Absolutely. think that's really helpful for sure. And no, I appreciate you bringing that up because that could it, help me greatly. Of course it's, I find I used to, this is just me personally. Like I used mm-hmm. to get really frustrated when I would see things that were kind of similar to conclusions that I'd come to on my own. I was Mm -hmm. like, that's the same thing as I thought of. Now I'm like, oh shit, I need to go read everything or see everything else that that person has put out because that shows me that that person thinks in a similar way that I do, which means I might be able to save myself some time because that person has already thought in probably some directions that I would think if given the right set of inputs. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll, I'll be sure to send you the, uh, the diagram and maybe a an article or two on it so you can check it out. But I just wanted to bring it up because I like I said, I thought it was really, really applicable to what you were describing. That's very illuminating for sure. I want to dive into something of a secondary topic. And I think right. it would really be a it, I would be really bummed if we didn't talk about this because I think this is something else that you are extremely good at. And it is less of a part of screenwriting explicitly. You might know what I'm already going towards. I don't. But world building, right? Oh, Setting yeah. up, building yeah, yeah. worlds, not just for screen, you know, uh, <laughs> not just for screenplays and for films yeah, yeah. and, you know, universes that you're creating with these stories that you're telling to put on screen, but also with um, like tabletop RPGs. Like you run a D&D campaign. You've run now multiple campaigns. And you are a an incredible world builder, and you have a, a knack for creating these vibrant scenes and and moving parts and pieces of characters and systems and lore and history and all these things. So how like how do you think of world building and how do you approach world building with all your other creative skills? Well, first off, thank you very much. I really appreciate that coming from you. Uh, B, it it does kind of just stem back to curiosity or interest. Like if they're, I think, what what I think literally is sounds so funny, but I think I don't know if I've even ever told you this before. But um, in the one shot D and D campaign that we did, um, where I was DMing, we were set in a world called the Halfway. For our listeners, it was a it was a a <laughs> realm. That was very like cyberpunk kind of retro wave kind of feel to it. 
And I just, I was just super intrigued at that moment. And at the time, I could be wrong, could be wrong. I swear, maybe that an underlying thing when I thought of that world is I was listening to the weekends album that came out. It was like 2020. I think maybe just like subconsciously at the time, I was like, oh, I really love the sound of this album. And how would that look visually to me? Mm -hmm. And I knew that this one shot that we were going to do was going to be filled with a bunch of heathens who I love dearly. <laughs> and so I wanted to make it like uh, like Grand Theft Auto. And I think at the time, cyberpunk was like also kind of coming, becoming a thing. I wasn't, I didn't get it or whatever, but I just, it was happening. So if you could create just a city that's like cyberpunk and you just have your audience who is going to play, have a world where they can just be crazy, go to go to the go to the club and listen to Tyga's Rack City while other stuff like and that's the other thing. There's a there you have to have the thing that I found specifically in those um D D campaigns is similarly to directing, which is interesting. It's not necessarily writing, but in, in managing the tabletop, it's much more of a director where you're collaborating and you're you're your even though you have the rules of the world and you have the rules of kind of the main beats that you want to get to, mm -hmm. ultimately you're working with everyone at the table to allow them to achieve and tell the story that they want to tell. As a director, as a, in a short film, who would I be if I hire a costume designer? And I may have notes, obviously, like I want like a certain look or a certain thing. But after I, after I tell that costume designer, like what my inspiration, what the vision is, and we go back and forth on the script, he or she like would have a great idea. And like, I would trust, do the thing that would excite them, do the thing that allows them to, that got them there in the first place or wanted them to have that inspiration. Same thing with tabletops. If they, if a care, if a player has a certain idea that they want for their character, I want to try my best to have them do that thing they want to do. <laughs> because then, at that point, it's not a collaborative art. And at that point, I think when you get to directing, when you have so many different people at the table on mm -hmm. set, mm -hmm. it becomes more than just the thing on the page it becomes what team you're building. And I think as someone who has like always loved sports, especially baseball, especially my, my Padres, I've seen bad teams and I've seen really good teams. Yeah. And I think the best teams and, and I, it's tougher because film sets and there are so many different stigmas and how many, different ways people run film sets. Some of them, like they take a very business minded. Some of them are very team oriented. Some of them are like family oriented, which is like, it sounds to me like very lovely, but you also have to understand that there are other people who are just, they're working. That's their job. They don't right. want to be a part of the family. They don't really care. So you have to curtail your own ideas, your own visions, whatever mm -hmm. to who do you have at the table with you? This this is this is both D and D, but also uh, an analogy for filmmaking and any other thing. Who's with you? It could be music. Who's who's running the? Who's engineering your song? How, how are they best utilized? It's at the end of the day when that becomes a thing, it's very collaborative. And any you know any art that requires more than just one person it immediately at some point inherently becomes someone else's thing too. It's not just yours anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the best way to world build and to have people around you at the same time is to allow the players at your table to have the freedom that they want to have. Because without that, then your world can't, you just have a world and it's, it exists. Yeah. And it's and it's cool and 
maybe I've tangented a little bit and not directly answered the question about world building itself and kind of morphed it into like how players and characters kind of you're coming, like you're bringing it back. You're interact. You're, you're threading with, with it, it back in. I'm glad. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's about creating something that you feel like the players at your table will respond to. Mm. And if it's something that they really enjoy, your audience enjoys. And something that, in the case of D&D, it's interesting because you know your audience and you know your audience at like 6 or 10 or whoever. Um, And if you can find something that you enjoy, it doesn't mean you have to like send out a Google, Google form to be like, what's your favorite environment? Like, you don't have to do that. Like, yeah. be steadfast and think that you're interested in. <laughs> but if you can fill that world with things that you're interested in, but also allowing your players to find fun in the world, like if you have a bunch of science fiction freaks, but you do it, you make a world that's like high, fant- high, like, classical fantasy set in the olden days and like people aren't going to have fun. Yeah. So if you do kind of have to again, unfortunately, like you have to know your audience. And if it is a world that you really want to build and create and you are stuck to that medieval classical fantasy thing, then you again, like we talked about, you hook them in with like these are the familiar beats with whatever. But then you you shake them up a little bit, and then you're like, yeah. "Oh, this is interesting. I didn't expect that." But then, oh, okay, this is something that I expect. Shake it up a little bit. Right. It's interesting. Oh, it's beyond interesting. And the way that you have drawn parallels between directing and running a a tabletop session in D anD D or any tabletop RPG, it's so interesting to hear because your points about collaboration and about you know driving the narrative forward and maybe being taking ownership of, okay, these are the key points that we need to hit. These are our big milestones. These are the summits. These are the mm-hmm. the big moments, the ends of every right. act, right? This is this is where we need to end up at the end of every act. How we get there is up to you guys. Like, And I'm just here to make sure we're steered in the right direction and we're aiming roughly in the direction of the thing we, we need to end up at, right? Mm-hmm. There's a saying, um, and for listeners, both Justice and I have, have DM'd campaigns, there's a saying that I really like about DMing, which is as a DM, your job is to kind of move mountains in the background, right? Mm-hmm. Where you're 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 always letting your players run and have fun and go in directions that they think are cool. And when they're facing towards one thing, part of your job is making sure that the set is kind of rotating behind them to make sure that the best and the most interesting things are always coming up in ways that keep them engaged, but also that keep the story moving forward. Right. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that's I I love the way you've just drawn a parallel between directing and a set and a tabletop. And to your point, you mentioned knowing your audience, right? And how there's when you when you're at a tabletop, you know your audience. I would say if you can make something that's entertaining to four people and captivating to four people, you can make something that's entertaining for any moving going crowd. Because when you think about the size of groups that go and see movies. You go and see it with a few friends. You go see it with your family, right? You're you're maybe up to four or five, six at most. So I think there's some really sage wisdom in that too of saying, if you can find a narrative that six people will engage with, that's probably going to engage with a lot of people. I completely agree with you. If you, regardless of the size, regardless of the size of who you're, who you're doing, like it, 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 it is, it, it is a valuable skill to know where your interest and what you want to tell through whatever storytelling method that you want Mm -hmm. and then how to apply that and deliver it to a group of four to six people or thousands of people. Again, a really cool parallel to be drawn in creative collaboration with letting the other people that come to the story imprint their own fingerprint on the narrative as a whole and how that adds so much to the picture and so many things that the group without that person, without that collaborator and thinking about people that show up at tabletop sessions as collaborators, not just, you know, yes, they're it's the traditional terms are game runner, dungeon master and players. Really it's, you know, lead table, lead table collaborators, right? That's, that's really what it breaks down to. And, 
Mm-hmm. It's yeah, that on film sets, on music projects, it's all there is a there's a really cool parallel that you've pulled out and and really touched on, I think, really well there, which is yeah, I, I love that. So first question to start wrapping us up. What is your current creative North Star? My current creative North Star. Yes. Is the hope and dream that I can show other kids. This is kind of why I started Rebel Kids Entertainment. It's not just a production company. It was off of of a principle. It was, I want to be able to create an environment where kids can feel like they can express themselves in whatever, which manner they would like, whether that be artistic, whether that be through anything else. I know how to provide that just by doing movie filmmaking stuff, whether editing or whatever. But ultimately, I want to create and through my creation, through whatever projects that I make, whether and it's it's beautiful. I I wasn't expecting it at this scale. I always imagined it or hoped it would be if it was a movie that I made or a script that I wrote, it would inspire someone. But it was um, it was recently, and I I completely. I mean, if if I had the, or I would look them up from years and years ago when I made this one Padres hype video. I forget what it was about. Forget everything. But I made a video, and I really enjoyed it. I look. I there are some where you just know that they hit more than others, and there are some that are just like I really enjoyed making this, and that and that's fine. And you just put it out there, and that's cool. But it connected with someone on the internet that I didn't know of, and someone in response, like a family member, said, "Hey." My daughter really loved that Padres hype video that you put out. She made her own because of the hype video that like she watched, whether it was Fernando, Manny, whoever. And that was everything. Like that was it. Like that was that was the North Star. That was I was able to make something that made someone feel confident that like, oh, I can do that. Or that's super cool. If and if I can make myself as accessible as possible to anyone that wants to be creative or have questions. And I, I don't have, I don't have all the answers. And I just realized that I'm using a USB electrical port thing as like a fidget holder thing, which is great <laughs> for the podcast audience uh, that I'm here that like, I, I want to be available and talk to people about the creative process and, I have questions of my own and I want to talk to people who feel like there's a, there's a barrier to entry to doing music or filmmaking or whatever. I want them to feel like they can, they can just do it. And when I saw, I was so happy when I saw that, that hype video that was like, my daughter made this. She saw your video. It was super cool. She made this. I, yeah, like a, a Denzel single tear dropped from my eye because it, it was gorgeous. And I think that's, that's to me what it's all about is just it's not inspire it's not inspiring whoever young younger older people our age whatever it's just about making people feel comfortable and thinking that oh that's super cool that's something that I can do and it's not some overwhelming thing like I can't write a I can't write a feature film script because it's a feature film script but if you just write stuff down on a note card put it up on a wall and you just have this idea that you love and you put, keep putting it up on the wall soon enough. Like we said at the beginning of the, of the podcast, soon your wall is going to run out of space and you're going to be like, Oh, this, is there a movie here? I think there's a movie here. Yeah. And then you take the time to organize it. And so I think that's my answer to what's your current, like North star when it comes to creativity is just whatever I put out, I hope that people, I hope that I, in response to whatever I put out, can like have that person see what I'm doing mm-hmm. and know that they can do that too. And whatever access that I can give back, whether that be questions or whatever that 
whatever whatever I can give. That's fucking beautiful, man. I really like that answer. Thank you. Okay. Wrap up question number two. If you could reach back and give a piece of advice, creative or otherwise, to Justice one year ago, what would it be? Make stuff. Just 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 make make stuff. I I it's very simple. It's very, very simple. I think more specifically, I wish I directed and made more short films, movies, whatever. Because I, I got into uh, a routine of writing a bunch, and I've kind of I feel like I've I've lost myself kind of as a director behind the camera, mm-hmm. which I I've done for a long time. But yeah, I think advice I'd give Justice a year from now is to just go out and film stuff, grab some of my actor friends, and just make a short film. Just finish it, make it cool, and um, there's. There will be some short films and movies to be directed this year, which I'm very excited about um, making some progress with. Uh, I'm trying to direct a couple short films by the end of, the end of this year. Um, but yes, if I could tell Justice what to do a year ago, what advice I would say, get behind the camera, go film some stuff, and keep that other side of the brain itched. So last question is, what are some ways for people to keep up with all of the exciting things that you are doing. Oh, wow. Uh, I You can primarily follow me uh, on Twitter at Justice G, as in Gregory Parman, Justice G Parman. Okay. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, just at my name, Justice Parman. Uh, don't use Facebook that much. Twitter, I probably... I, 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 Twitter is just in constant flux. Who knows? That's just where I am currently. I am building a website that you can find me at, and it'll be my. I have the domain name. It's justiceparman.com. I'm on the internet. You, you got deep cuts. Me. Deep cuts you can, of Justice Parman. You, you can find me. We will certainly make sure that the correct links are posted in the show notes for anybody that's listening that wants to find justice. DMs are open. DMs are very open. And, and I know you, you will respond to everybody who DMs you. So if you are thinking about DMing justice, just do it already. What are you waiting for? Yeah, just do it. Bro, this has been such an enjoyable conversation. I loved what we talked about and just the depth that we got to on some of those questions and topics. I think your way of drawing parallels between things like directing and filmmaking and music and writing and just the whole creative process, the way that you work through it is so fascinating and fun to dive into and talk about. I I've said this before to you. I love when we have these conversations. I think this is very typical of us to go in, you know, a few different directions and really scratch on some stuff that's really heavy in mind, but not necessarily comes out all the time in in chats. So really appreciate you doing this. This was a ton of fun. Well, thank you for having me again. And it's it's bizarre because I we we've done this so many times. Like we've talked so many times, and you're like, oh, surely, surely there's there's nothing that Jamie and I haven't broached in conversation before. <laughs> surely there isn't. But lo and behold, there you go. And that's just testament to you as a host. And uh, I I really appreciate you having me on. That is it for this episode of the Create Connected podcast. If you haven't already, go down below and like and subscribe to help others find the show. If you want to continue the discussion about anything that you've just listened to, go ahead and leave a comment down below. I do my best to reply to all of them. Finally, remember that the Create Connected podcast has a companion newsletter. In that newsletter, we talk about standouts and highlights from this episode, actionable tips that you can use to improve your creative process, and a bunch of other cool stuff. Go sign up for free and get the latest episode at createconnected.com. That's it for now. I'll see you next time. Peace.